Uh, my name is Klaus Röhrborn and I'm professor and chair of the Department of Urology at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. I've been at this institution for all my professional life and I have been chair here since 2002. It's a very complicated question and an equally complicated answer. Over the last 25, 30 years, we have collected data on how men respond to the treatment with various medication, mostly alpha blockers and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors alone or in combination in response to their voiding symptoms and storage symptoms. These symptoms are usually captured by something that is known as a symptom score or AUA symptom score or IPSS or International Prostate Symptom Score. That symptom score consists of seven questions. Some of them concern themselves with voiding symptoms such as slow stream, hesitancy, uh, intermittent stream, having to strain to urinate, and some concern themselves with uh, other symptoms such as storage symptoms, frequent urination, urgency of urination, and nighttime urination. Over these 30 years, there have been dozens and dozens of randomized controlled trials done to show that these medications work for these symptoms in most men one way or the other. This study that was presented here uh, is a major effort to study actually the response, not only in regards to the total symptom score, but also in regards to the storage and voiding symptoms independently in a cohort of nearly 9,200 men who have been treated in various studies sponsored by GlaxoSmithKline, and not only study that, but also make it a dynamic nomogram type assessment and evaluation. In other words, in this study, in this effort, all the baseline parameters of those patients, 9,200 who were involved in these trials, have been the input so if a man is 60 or 70 or 80, if a man has a 40 or 80 gram prostate, if his PSA is 2 or 4 or 6, if a symptom score is 15, 20 or 25, if his flow rate is 8 or 10 or 15 milliliter per second, all those baseline parameters were entered. And then a mathematical modeling was developed, a predictive model to determine how these baseline parameters over time influence the response of the patients in terms of the symptom improvement, both storage and voiding symptoms. Now, the studies lasted between two and four years. So the projections, in other words, the prediction models carried therefore out to either two years in the case of a placebo treatment or four years in the case of a treatment with either tamsulosin or dutasteride or a combination of dutasteride and tamsulosin. Now, this had to do with the setup of the original studies because they were run out to four years, such as a combat trial, and the placebo-controlled trials, they were run out to two years. So we only have placebo data for two years. So this is actually a dynamic model, and it's meant to be a web-based tool. So a provider, just to spin this out, could be sitting in his office, having a patient in front of him, go on the web and go to this tool called the bphtool.com. And he could take the patient's information who sits in front of him. So he's, let's say, 67 years old, his PSA 3.7, his prostate size is 60 gram. He has a poor flow rate of 6 ml per second. And he will give in all these information and data, and the model will now tell the doctor what is to be expected if the patient is not treated at all, i.e. placebo? What is to be expected if he gets tamsulosin? What is to be expected if he gets dutasteride or a combination? And one can also extrapolate by saying, what is to be expected if he gets an alpha block or a 5-ARI, assuming they have similar efficacy? And that's a powerful tool, this kind of dynamic prediction modeling or nomogram online to really guide patients' decision-making and how the physician can counsel the patient. Because there's not a physician who can juggle all these numbers and these predictions in his head and come up with a reasonable answer. So that's the fundamental setup of the model. And I should mention that there has already been prior work done. And the prior work that was done focused on the total symptom score, not the storage avoiding subscore. And it focused on something also very, very important, namely on predicting the risk for the patient to go into retention, in other words, not being able to urinate at all, 
and having to have surgery. That is also part of the tool that one can do online, and that has been already published in the scientific literature late last year. This work here is an enhancement to look at storage and voiding subscores and specifically also at Nocturia. So this is not a simple matter, and that's why my explanation took quite a bit of time. I hope you'll uh, grasp the concepts here, and I'll be happy to go into specific questions. So this study, coupled with its sister study that was presented last year at various meetings, and we had a major symposium at the SIU meeting in Montreal, and there is a published uh, citation already in the literature, coupled with this new insight, the new analysis on voiding and subscore, as well as nocturia, actually empowers physicians. It empowers physicians and providers all over the world to basically give their patients a realistic expectation what to expect. Now, in the past, physicians would look at their patient and say, look, you have BPH, I give you this drug, probably you have an improvement in your symptom. Let me know, come back a month or three later, and we'll talk about it. That's it. That's what the doctor would say. Now the doctor would say, well, sir, at your age, 67, with your prostate size, 60 gram, with your PSA, 3.8, with your flow rate, your, your, uh, your symptom score, and your voiding and, 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 and storage subscore, I will show you why I want to give you this specific medication, why I want to give you a combination of dutasteride and tamsulosin. Because as you can see here, that has over four years the best chance of improving not only your overall symptoms, but specifically also what bothers you the most, namely your storage symptom, the frequency, the urgency, the nighttime urination, the nocturia. And so the doctor can type in the parameters. The graphs are populated on the screen. The patients can see it. The doctor can see it. And the patient visually uh, perhaps is uh, you know, convinced or is encouraged to go down this road and take this particular medication. I, I want to be honest with you and tell you also that it's possible that a patient presents with symptoms and a combination of size of the prostate and PSA and perhaps uh, other values such as residual urine that the doctor will show him on the screen and he will say, sir, your prostate is so large, it is 150 grams, your PSA is eight, and your symptom score is so high that your risk of going into retention or having to have surgery is so high, you really need to consider whether or not you want to even do medication. Maybe you should consider a surgery. Or he will tell the patient, you have a calculated risk of going into retention and needing surgery of 20% over four years. So if you take this medication, that risk is cut down to 5%. So I really urge you to take these medications because that risk is reduced by 75% relative and 15% absolute reduction if you take that medication. Now, I believe if you are able to tell the patient ad hoc, live on the screen, using predictive data for 9,200 men, that will be a powerful argument and will be very empowering. And actually, every doctor, even primary care doctors, theoretically can use that. Now, granted, they may not know the patient's prostate size and a flow rate and residual urine, but they may know his age, his symptom score. They may know also uh, his PSA, for example. Um, and so they can give the patient also information, perhaps in a limited manner, but they give some information. Specialists, urologists, however, can give a very detailed forecast to their patients in terms of what to expect. So Nocturia, the frequency of nighttime urination or defined as the number of times a patient has to wake up to go to the restroom from the time he goes to bed to the time he wakes up in the morning is the most bothersome symptoms for most patients. 
the, the definition says that if a man has to get up two or more times between the time he goes to bed and the time he wakes up in the morning, is two. If it's two or more, that is nocturia. So that is very prevalent, very common, and actually that is what drives many patients to the doctor. Much of it can be negotiated by fluid management and lifestyle adjustments. So, for example, patients who have a glass of water on their nightstand and drink all night long when they wake up, that's not a good idea, so they need to cut that out. Patients who drink a couple of beers with dinner or watching TV, that's probably not a good idea. Some people nurse along iced tea or hot tea in the evening. That's probably not a good idea. So that can be all remedied and removed and helped. However, there's a core group of patients for sure that have nocturia despite fluid managed, despite all of that, perhaps as a result of their enlarging prostate and their bladder behavior. So our study has shown that medication therapy can impact nocturia and the greatest impact on nocturia is actually achieved in the study was combination medical therapy, namely an alpha blocker and a 5-hour reductase inhibitor. Indeed, the study has shown that tamsulosin alone, the alpha blocker, is not very powerful over four years to actually influence nocturia. However, over time, the combination therapy can positively influence it. And one subplot of the study is actually that patients who had in the past taken an alpha blocker so a patient comes to me and says, Doc, I already tried Flomax, I already tried Alfusosin, I already tried uh, Psilodosin. If I put that patient on a combination therapy, um, then I can achieve a significant additional effect. Also, older age predicts a significant worsening of nocturia. So for example, patients 65 years and younger treated with combination therapy had a greater improvement with the combination therapy compared to dutasteride. So um, there are some uh, associations between the baseline parameters, age, perhaps prostate size, PSA, symptom severity, flow rate, residual urine, et cetera, and the response to nocturia. But in general, if a patient had a higher residual urine, that is, he didn't empty his bladder very well, and a lower peak urinary flow rate predicts a significant worsening of nocturia over time. So that makes sense. If you think about it, if a patient has a higher residual urine, then there is always some urine in the bladder and it takes a shorter time for that bladder to fill up completely and the patients have to get up and urinate again. So this is a database again of that 9,200 patients nearly there's a lot of patients in this database that have a little residual urine, have a lot of residual urine, all the way up to 250 milliliters. So it's a very powerful database to make this statement. And so if a patient has a very high residual urine, he needs to be aware of that. And by treating that patient appropriately, that residual urine probably can be lowered. And if we lower the residual urine, and the patient likely has an improvement in his nocturia, and that may very well be how the combination therapy works. So all in all, a powerful tool for the direct and immediate counseling of the healthcare provider to the patient in terms of his current baseline status, in terms of what to expect in terms of symptom score improvement, in terms of sub-score improvement, avoiding and storage, in terms of changing nocturia, nighttime urination, based on the patient's presentation, based on his data when he presents to the physician at that moment in time, forward projected out to two years for placebo or four years for the medical therapy. That's the power of this nomogram. That's the power of this predictive modeling uh, in enabling the physicians to have that meaningful conversation and counseling.